So good, e good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Darla Pompilio of Your Tasks, Our Time, Senior Move Management and Professional Organizing. Our goal for tonight's presentation is to provide information about how to protect your assets as you transition into various levels of care. Our organization is Senior Services Network of Southeastern PA. We started Senior Services Network because most people are not sure where to begin when navigating resources and often don't know what resources are needed until something actually happens. We are a group of professionals focused on providing senior services to seniors. Our goal is to be one place where seniors, caregivers, and families can have access to service providers in the Southeastern PA area. So tonight, I would like to introduce our two speakers. Uh, first speaker is Rich L. Newman, Esquire, of the Law Office of Richard L. Newman. And Richard is the founder of Newman Elder Law, with an office in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Mr. Newman is licensed in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and practices elder law and special needs planning. His practice serves clients in Bucks and Montgomery counties, Philadelphia and the surrounding suburbs. Mr. Newman has more than 35 years of legal experience and is the chair of the Pennsylvania Bar Elder Law Section. Also, we have uh, Dave Emery this evening. Dave is a senior uh, financial planner with the Planning Capital Management, with Planning Capital Management, and has provided wealth management and financial planning services to clients in the Philadelphia area since 1997. Dave's financial planning practice focuses on the sandwich generation, those between the ages of 45 and 65 that are financially balancing, raising and educating their kids, planning for their own retirements and helping their aging parents. He has helped many families transition into retirement life and helped aging parents transition into retirement communities. So uh, before our speakers begin, I want to invite those who have questions for the panelists to please add those questions to the chat. And after both speakers have completed their presentations, we will go to your questions. So right now, I'm gonna turn it over to Rich and Dave to just get us started. Well, well thank you. Uh, thank you, Darla. Uh, and um, I guess I'll uh, kind of start off here a little bit and then Rich, you can, you can kind of uh, jump in. So. What we're going to talk about tonight, like from my perspective, I'll be talking about the legal perspective, or I'm sorry, the, the financial perspective, uh, not the Sear of Thunder there, Rich. Um, and uh, there, there's four areas that, that, that we'll focus on in, in particular. One is with regards to uh, your lifestyle, and a lot of that has to do with cash flow. Second part has to do with taxes, understand how, to, uh, how the tax impacts on some of these choices families have to make. Uh, the third is uh, tight. we'll talk a little bit about some of the different types of assets and how, how they can impact um, these transitioning. And lastly is, uh, is with regards to estate wishes. And by that, from a financial perspective, what I mean is you wanna leave a legacy to, to, your, um, to your heirs or some people just say, uh, I want to spend everything, um, you know, uh, just spend everything. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Rich. Uh, Talk a little bit about the legal side. Hey, Rich, you gotta unmute yourself. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, Darla. It, uh, Dave, it's always a pleasure and an honor sharing this presentation with you. Uh, the, thing that I wanted to, the thing that I wanted to touch on, at least initially, is what you see in that first slide which is that the average annual cost of skilled nursing home care in Pennsylvania is now over $176,000. And two things that I just wanted to bring to your attention regarding that. One is that that is the average annual cost in Pennsylvania. So that means it takes into account nursing homes in the central and north central part of the state. And generally those costs are less than they are in our part of the state. So the average or the annual cost of skilled care in this part will probably be higher than that amount. And the other thing that I wanted to bring out is that this number, 176,000 is actually $40,000 more 
then the costs last year, so nursing home costs are rising exorbitantly. And it's so easy to see why people who have saved all their lives, hoping to pass on some financial legacy to their children can have a, a lot or <clears throat> all of what they save for completely usurped by even a modest stay in a nursing home. So that is why the subject of asset protection planning is so important to my clients as an elder law attorney. Very good, Rich. I guess I'll piggyback one minor um, uh, side note on that. That 176, I mean, you pay for that with after-tax dollars. So, so if you're pulling money out of an IRA that's never been taxed before, you know, that in, in essence could be, that number could be even higher, right? You know, safe to say, so. All right, gentlemen, thank you. So I have a few questions for you. Is uh, The first one is, is long-term care insurance worth buying? Won't the government take care of me if I need it? Well, I think that's a, that's a great question. That's certainly one that I, I've heard of a, a lot from the financial perspective. And I guess when, when people consider long-term care um, and if uh, uh, it's worth buying, there, I, I, when I chat through with them, there, there's four different areas I look at um, uh, to, to consider whether you, you know how, how to pay for, for care. And the first is, First area is to self-insure, and by that, what I mean is um, just is pay for the for whatever care you, you have out of your own assets and, and, and income. So that that's one choice, and that of course, just like Rich said, is pretty darn expensive at one hundred seventy-six thousand dollars. The second choice is a lot of times people say, "Well, I'm just going to be a burden on my friends and family," and that's that's you know have somebody you know have friends or family. You know, provide the caregiving, and that that's fine. That that's a second that's a second choice, and people do opt for that. The third is, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, tonight, is 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 to go on Medicaid, um, and that's um, that's spending down your assets to a to to a, a very low level, where um, the government can, will 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 provide for your care based on Medicaid, and then the fourth, which. Uh, um, uh, is, is is by transferring some of that financial risk to an insurance company, but in the form of buying a long-term care policy. And uh, Beth and our uh, on in our group is someone that you can certainly talk to about that. But that that's the fourth reason um, area to consider is is basically having buying an insurance policy and having the insurance policy pay for some of that. Now, a lot of times it's not just one one of any of these four. Sometimes it's it's a combination of any of these four different areas that, that people follow to provide for care. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to, so is it worth buying? Those are the considerations to, th to think about whether it's worth buying. Now I'll turn it over to Rich. Uh, will, uh, won't the government take care of me? You know, what, what do you think about it there, Rich? Well, Dave, I would think you thought it was a good question since you wrote it. Um, <laughs> A couple of things that I, I want to bring to all of your attention, and by the way, I do not sell long-term care insurance, so I have no vested interest in whether or not a person purchases it, but I definitely some, see some advantages with long-term care insurance. But the first thing I wanted to do is to address the last thing that Dave said is, won't the government take care of me? And the answer for most people is no. There are people who think that Medicare will pay for someone's long-term care. <clears throat> and unfortunately, that's far from being the case. The only thing that Medicare pays for is up to 100 days of skilled care for an eligible individual per spell of illness. And generally, Medicare doesn't uh, even allow people to get to that 100-day mark. So when people go into a rehab facility from a hospital, thinking that, well, they'll be there as long as they need to be there, and then Medicare will keep paying for their rehab, and then if they need to go into a nursing home, Medicare will pay for that too. That's not, that doesn't happen. What happens is that maybe a week or two after they have been in the facility, they'll get a notice from the facility saying, well, your Medicare is no longer paying for your care. So either you be, have to be discharged 
or go on private pay. So the government doesn't pay for long-term care. And the other thing I wanted to bring out is um, there are different levels of long-term care and folks who attended some of our previous presentations are certainly aware that there are different levels. You can live independently, you can live in personal care or memory care or assisted living care or skilled nursing care or be in a continuing care retirement community. And out of all those different levels of care, really the only levels that are covered by Medicaid, which does pay for significant parts of long-term care is skilled nursing care and some in-home care. The rest is generally all private pay. So a long-term care insurance policy, if you have the right policy, can basically fill in those gaps and pay for some of those levels of care that are not covered by any form of public benefits. And then the last thing that I wanted to say in this regard is that a long-term care insurance policy can be coupled with something called a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. And that will allow people who are able to utilize that strategy to protect possibly significant amounts of assets, whereas people who don't have long-term care insurance may not be able to avail themselves of that strategy. So those are a couple of things I think people should keep in mind when they're deciding whether or not to purchase long-term care insurance. Good points. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. So I have another question. Should I gift my house to my kids? Should I gift my house to my kids? <clears throat> um, well, I, uh, I definitely hear this regularly. Um, uh, and the, I, I guess a couple of the points from a financial perspective is uh, when, once you gift an asset to, to somebody, you know, it, it's, it's gifted. It's not like uh, you can take it back. So that's, uh, that's the first thing to think about. Um, but the second thing, uh, I think, from a, from a financial perspective to think through is a lot of times people will do this thinking they're, they're saving money on taxes. And um, by gifting a house to, to your kids, um, your, your kids end up picking up the, the, if there's a profit in the house, meaning you bought it for one price and it's appreciating you sell it for another price. If they, if, if you gift it to them, they pick up the, the bill when, when you go to sell it from the, the capital gains, the profit that's made on that house. So that's one thing to think through. And a lot of times the, uh, the other piece, people say, well, I don't want to pay inheritance tax. Well, the difference between the two in Pennsylvania, and this is something that people should always run by their, their tax advisors first, but you know, for rough numbers, you know, capital gains rates are, are like 15% to the federal government. And I, and I believe, Rich, you might know this a little, little better, but like um, Pennsylvania inheritance tax, I think from a, from a, um, from a parent to a, a, you know, a, a child or a, to a, an adult child is like 5.6% you know, or 6%. So so there's a difference in the tax rate. So to me, uh, you know, kind of getting back, should I give to my, my house to my kids? I think most of the times what I've seen is it does not make financial sense to gift the house to the kids. What makes better financial sense is once, once you pass to have those, those monies go to the kids by way of, by way of a will. But, but again, everybody's different. You definitely ought to consult your financial and legal uh, or in, uh, tax people. What do you think there, Rich, from a legal well, they, perspective? More words of wisdom, so thank you for that. <laughs> I a also, disclosure. <laughs> oh, by the way, the inheritance tax rate for children and grandchildren are like is 4.5%. But I also get this question a lot. People say, well, should I give my house away to my children so they don't get it? And when I ask what they mean by they, they're usually talking about the nursing home or the state. Mm. So you know, should I give my house away to my children so the nursing home doesn't get it or the state doesn't get it? And I tell them a couple of things. One is that nursing homes or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, they don't want your house. They've got enough problems with the real estate they already own. And two, for most people, a house is an exempt resource. It doesn't even count towards Medicaid eligibility. And three, if you give your house away to a child, you are setting yourself up for a heap Oh, trouble. 
Most wow. people I know have come into contact with have heard of something called the five-year look-back rule. They don't usually know what it means, but generally it means that you can't have given away assets within five years of the date you claim you're Medicaid eligible. And how does this play itself out when it comes to a house? Well, let's say hypothetically that my buddy Al, who's over there on my left, decides he wants to give his house away uh, to his children. Uh, two years ago, he did that. And then two years later, now he finds himself in a nursing home and he has no more money. So he applies for Medicaid to pay for his nursing home bill. The state's going to find out that he gave his house away within the last five years. The house was, let's say, worth $350,000. The state will then take the fair market value of that house, divide it by the average daily cost of nursing home care, which is $482.50. And that will create a period of ineligibility of 725.39 days. So we're talking almost two years where there will be no source to pay the nursing home bill because Al's broke, he, he ain't got no money, so he can't pay. And the state's not going to pay because of this penalty period created by the house. Pennsylvania has something called the filial responsibility law. It's a law that's been around since colonial times. And basically the law says that children of indigent parents are responsible for their parents' bills. And nursing homes have used this filial responsibility law as a way of collecting on their unpaid bills from children because their parents engaged in improper gifting, like giving the house away. So it's a, for most people, especially when you're talking about seniors who are worried about potential long-term care scenarios, for most of those people, it's a really terrible thing to do. It's a huge mistake. And I almost would never recommend something like that. Wow, okay. All right then, so. A uh, third question is, I want to give my assets to my kids so I can qualify for Medicaid for my long-term care. Can I do that? Well, I guess we talked a little bit about that, but um, I guess you know, I'll talk uh, briefly about the financial aspect of it. So you know, to qualify for Medicaid, <clears throat> the, the financial limits are quite low. It's, it's approximately $2,400 a month of income or about $8,000 in accessible resources. So, and then of course, what Rich just went through with the five-year look back and the, I love that word, fa, what was it again? Familial law, yeah. Filial. Filial law, that's it. <laughs> so um, because of both of those, um, um, really, you know, it takes some time to get down to those levels or, um, you know, those levels are quite low, so. To get my assets, um, I think, uh, you know, I, I usually don't, I, you know, I, I don't see something like that being prudent to do. How about you, Rich? Well, first of all, for those of you who are keeping score at home, it's spelled F as in Frank, I-L-I-A-L, -L, filial responsibility law. You don't ever want to expose your children to bills because of that law. Yeah, so we just talked about why giving assets away is not really the best asset protection planning strategy. And I do come across people who think that it's the it cat's meow mm -hmm. and that they need to do something like that. And you really have to talk them off a, a cliff. But I do want to point out that there are some asset transfers that are permissible. For example, you can, in Pennsylvania, give what's called de minimis gifts, which is a Latin word for small. So here in Pennsylvania, you are allowed to give away up to $500 a month total. That doesn't mean $500 in a given month to each of your children. It means you have to split the $500 amongst your children. New Jersey, by the way, 
doesn't even allow that. They don't have any amount that you're allowed to give away. And there are also some other exceptions to this five-year look-back rule. You can, for example, pay a child for to take care of you. You can prepare something called a family caregiver agreement where you pay them for their care. They have to declare the money they receive as income and you have to submit a 1099 or W-2 to the child, but it's a doable thing. If you have a disabled child under the age of 65, then you can transfer assets either directly to that child, which usually is not a good idea, or into a special needs trust, which would be set up for that child. And again, as long as that child is under the age of 65, you can transfer assets into that trust, knowing that those assets will be able to be used for that child's benefit, no matter how long you are in the nursing home. So there are some gifts that are allowed, but <clears throat> by and large, you really have to be careful. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the great show of Hill Street Blues, but in the beginning of the show, Sergeant Phil Esterhaus used to always end his roll call by saying, let's be careful out there. And that's my advice to all of you. Let's be careful out there. Don't listen to Uncle Bob. Get some <laughs> so professional advice. So I got a question then for you, Rich, maybe piggyback off of this. Um, um, so you mentioned how New Jersey uh, doesn't allow you to do that. Any gifting PA is it's de minimis. Or other, uh, so is it safe to assume that <clears throat> other states have other laws? And, and is this state driven or is this federally driven with the five-year look back? Well, Dave, you asked a lawyer a question. And I will tell you that nine out of 10 times when you ask a lawyer a question, the answer to the question is it depends. And of course, this is an it depends question. So it does depend. Uh, there are Medicaid is a federal program. The general eligibility rules for Medicaid were set up through the federal government. But each state has its own rules and procedures on how to implement the Medicaid program. So there are a lot of nuances from state to state on what is acceptable and what is not. The things I'm telling you today are Pennsylvania specific. And so you should never even remotely think about using some of this advice in other states. Good point. All right, thank you. So I'd like to know, are naming beneficiaries important? Wow, so that, that's, a, that's a very good question too. So <clears throat> from a financial perspective, um, some of the concerns on uh, regarding beneficiaries, well, one in particular that comes to my mind is regarding naming beneficiaries on an IRA or a 401k. That is very important um, uh, to name some, you know, a living, breathing person entity as opposed to just naming your estate. And the reason I say that is if you if you name your estate, and let's say your 401k is worth uh, $400,000 and you name your, your estate as the sole beneficiary of that, which in turn means those monies go by way of the will, by the will, you know, the, the, the will the person has. By naming your, your estate that when you pass, that entire amount becomes taxable in the year that you pass. As opposed to naming, say, uh, you, know, uh, you know, two or three or four kids or whatever, that thing, by naming your kids, then, then they, inherit, they, they, they inherit this money by way of being a beneficiary. It gets split between them, however it's set up, and then they get to, they get to take it out over a, a potentially longer period of time as opposed to the year you pass. So the big reason, and, and also to remember that you know, some people say, well, I, that's fine. I don't mind if I, it gets all taxed in one year. Well, the one thing to think about is the tax rates, the fed, and this I'm talking federally taxed, the tax rates are progressive, which means the more you make, the higher you get taxed on the amount. So um, uh, again, you know, from, a, from an IRA or 401k, especially, you know, so it, assuming that the monies have never been taxed, it absolutely makes sense <clears throat> to, to name beneficiaries on, on those entities. So, um, um, Rich, what do you think? 
Well, Dave, as always, a gourmet meal's worth of food for thought from you. Um, <laughs> so I have a couple other considerations you know. that I think need to be thought about. Uh, when it comes to naming beneficiaries, there's something that people, if they are on Medicaid or thinking about going <clears throat> on Medicaid, either to pay for in-home care through the home and community-based waiver program mm -hmm. or on nursing home Medicaid. There's a program that is in Pennsylvania and really every state in the country called State Recovery. And the Estate Recovery Program basically allows the state to go after the estate of a Medicaid beneficiary to recoup monies that the state has paid on behalf of that beneficiary. There are two different kinds of Medicaid estate recovery programs. One is called expanded Medicaid estate recovery. And basically that program says that any asset that you have when you pass away is subject to the state's claim. Here in Pennsylvania though, we have something called limited estate recovery. And that means that the Commonwealth's claim is only allowed to be made on what's called the probate assets of the Medicaid beneficiary. And basically that means assets that pass through that person's will. Mm -hmm. The problem is if you have life insurance that names the state as a beneficiary, that makes the life insurance proceeds subject to Medicaid estate recovery in Pennsylvania. Whereas if you name specific individuals as beneficiaries of that life insurance policy, that is considered a non-probate asset, which is mm -hmm. not subject to the state's Medicaid estate recovery claim. So you're talking about possibly $100,000 or more of assets that you are possibly exposing to the mm -hmm. Commonwealth's claim. Another thing that I just wanted to briefly mention is that if there's a situation where you have one spouse that's in a nursing home and the other spouse is not, I do recommend that the spouse that's not in the nursing home change the beneficiary designations of those non-probate assets to that spouse's children if applicable. Normally, the if there's no beneficiaries or if the beneficiary is the spouse and the spouse that's not in the nursing home passes away first then all of those assets are going to go to the spouse that's in the nursing home which mm -hmm. will then have to be spent down before that spouse can qualify or re-qualify for medical assistance uh, <clears throat> those are some a couple of great points i guess piggyback off of one of those i mean you know so I've also seen it where you have, you know, husband and wife, and uh, let's say that um, um, you know, the husband has a, has a life insurance policy, wife passes first, the husband never updates the beneficiaries of that. So, um, so in essence, when the husband passed, the policy still says it's supposed to go to the wife who is deceased. So when mm -hmm. that happens, what, what then happens since there's no entity to send the money to, it then goes per the terms of the will. So if you if you have, you know, and let's say the husband remarried and all the money goes to the will goes to the new spouse or some other place and the kids you know, aren't named in the will. I mean, you know, to your point, Rich, it's very important to um, to make sure that you're that you name beneficiaries and the, uh, the monies are going to where you would like to see it go. So I want to quickly piggyback on your piggybacking. <laughs> Um, if you have a child with special needs, as Jess would tell you, it's even more important to make sure that you name beneficiaries because you don't want to have that child inherit outright. If that child is getting public benefits like supplemental security income and or Medicaid, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that that child's special needs trust is the beneficiary. Good point. All right. Well, thank you. 
Okay, so I like to get back to gifting assets. I want <clears throat> to give assets to my kids now. Is that a good idea? Is that a good idea? Well, I guess uh, so. Maybe, maybe we'll kind of shift the focus a little bit from uh, um, you know to to what the gifting the gift tax rules are for uh, for gifting and. Um, you know, people say, well, I want to gift money and, and you can gift money without reporting it to the federal government on your tax returns up to, I think it's uh, this year in 2022, it's, you can give $16,000 to anybody uh, per year without reporting it to the federal government. If you're inclined to gift more than that, I mean, you can gift up to the, the uh, gift tax exemption. And I got to look at it here because it's, it's such a big number. Um, the gift tax, that's it. You got it, Rich. Million, not dollars. Twelve point oh six million dollars is uh, what the exemption is um, without paying tax. But you, but you know, to gift up to that, you do have to report that to the federal government by filing a, a gift tax return. So again, like we've kind of said earlier, you know, things to consider are that once you gift assets, it's it's, it's gifted. So I think it's very prudent to make sure that you have a financial plan in in place. And to take care of your, you know, make sure your, yourself is taken care of first before you start gifting your asset, uh, gifting your assets away. So, so Rich, what, what do you have to say about that? Well, Dave, I would like to impart a tale of woe. And I'd, I'd like to hear actually it. Actually, use that expression. I hardly ever get to use that expression. But I met with a married couple. I guess this is about five or six years ago. And they came to me and they said that they spoken, I guess this was with their accountant and their <clears> accountant <throat> told them that they could gift, I think the number back then was 12 or $13,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And so they have been giving their five children 12 to $13,000 every year because they were told that that's not a problem. And I told them that unfortunately there are two very distinct sets of gifting rules that are in play. One is the IRS rule, uh, but the ones that Dave was just so eloquently speaking about. Um, but the other is the Medicaid rules. And I, that's the thing that we've already just talked about. And they don't mix. Mm -mm. Therefore, if you are thinking that there is a possibility that you may need long-term care in the future and you're not of the financial status where you're worried about $12.06 million, <laughs> then I think you need to think more about those Medicaid gifting rules and keep it to that $500 or less. Otherwise, you're asking for trouble and your children are asking, you're asking for trouble for your children. Good point. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so one last question. Do I need someone to review my investments? <clears throat> Rich, you want to answer that one? Yeah, my answer to that <laughs> question would be talk to Dave Emery. <laughs> that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. I'm done. Yeah. So um, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I think it's prudent to have to make sure that somebody reviews reviews your investments just to make sure that, that your investments are in alignment with with your with your with both your lifestyle and your estate wishes and make sure that they're you know they're, they're in line with your with, with even your your ta you know managing your tax burden so um, um, um i think uh i think all that is important kind of like we say you know consider your lifestyle the taxes and how your assets are, are titled and and your legacy um, what I guess kind of the segue off of that, one, one of the things, questions I get also is, should I put my kids on my account, on my, on my checking account? And, uh, um, I think that's something that else to, that you need to carefully consider too. I mean, if it's, um, you know, if it's, if you're titling, uh, assets with the kids' names, you, you need to make sure you understand the tax implications of doing that, um, from both the tax perspective and, and the state perspective, you know, state inheritance tax perspective is what I mean. So, so Rich, what, do you have any comment about that last piece? Well, should I put my I kids on get, my accounts? I do you get, get that? asked that question a lot. Yeah. And 
I generally advise against it. There, mm -hmm. There is an advantage if you put a child's name <clears throat> on an account and you live for a year or more after that, then as far as the inheritance tax is concerned, you've reduced the value of the account. Mm. But you're also exposing that account to any creditors of your children. Uh, right. your children have as much right to use that money as you do. It's a risky proposition and you just need to be aware of all the pluses and minuses in doing that. And I do get asked, if I add my child's name to my account, does that reduce the value of the account if I ever have to go on Medicaid? And the answer to that question is almost always no. The only time it would is if your children made contributions to that account and then mm -hmm. the account value would be reduced in proportion to the value of the contributions made. One thing I do real quickly want to mention in terms of pre-planning, if you find, think you're in a situation where you may need to get long-term care, one of the things that I do recommend <clears throat> is that you take a look at your financial power of attorney. And that's a document in which you're giving someone the right to make financial decisions for you. It's really important to make sure that your financial power of attorney addresses the possibility that somebody may need to do things to protect your assets mm -hmm. when you're not able to do it yourself. And a lot of powers of attorney that I see that were not prepared by folks who do what I do don't address that. And that means that if you're no longer competent, but you're going into a nursing home, you can't use some of the strategies that I would typically utilize to protect assets. So it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, and kind of one more comment on that is I, what I've seen is, you know, I know this is certainly in the state, state of Pennsylvania, things have changed. I, I think with powers of attorney over the last 70, 70 years or so. Um, and again, I'm not, not a lawyer, but the one thing I've seen with regards to custodians, meaning like, you know, if, you, if your money's at, you know, Vanguard or wherever, um, if it's an old power of attorney, sometimes the legal departments will give you a hard time saying it really needs to be refreshed and you don't want to find that out when you need to have it have it done I, i've seen it before where i've had to really lean heavily on places like you know some of these custodians to, to do what they should be doing and they say well this thing this power of attorney was done like 20 years ago so it is good to have your estate documents looked at and potentially refreshed from time to time well, I just want to quickly touch on that, and I'm sure Jess would agree with me. Most powers of attorney, that if they were valid when they were written, are valid now. They're grandfathered in. And I've had issues where people, financial <laughs> institutions, have taken that approach. And I get pretty angry. And, yeah, I do too. Uh, it's wrong. They're totally wrong. Uh, and I've had to take it up the chain of command to finally get someone who actually realizes that the laws override their little processes and procedures mm -hmm. but that's a topic for another day yeah and i i i, I echo those those comments rich I, i've 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 seen it from personally from it within my family that same type of thing where i've had to get really uh vocal i'll leave it at that all right gentlemen um let's see if we have any questions from the audience beth do we have any questions Additional questions? Yes, we do. Um, so um, one of our participants asked about um, naming a nonprofit charity as a beneficiary of your estate. Does that get around any of these, um, these issues that you've been talking about or a beneficiary of your insurance policy or your 401k? Dave, can I just say one thing before you um, that is something that Jess Sauer from our group would probably be in a better position to address <clears throat> because she does estate planning. And I'm probably going to guess who asked that question, uh, but there are all kinds of ramifications, tax ramifications about naming charities. So you really want to make sure that you talk to your advisors, your accountant, your financial advisor, your estate planning attorney and take all of the nuances into account. I guess what I can, I can say is, yeah, I, I've had clients that will have like a, um, 
you know, I'll say like an IRA where they leave the majority of it to their, their kids, but then they'll, they'll put a, another, you know, they'll carve a piece of it out and they'll leave it to their church. So that, that's a nonprofit. And, um, you know, that's, um, yeah, that, that's, that's fine. Going to a nonprofit, it's, it's, uh, you know, that gets around the whole tax thing. Yes. But it also reduces the stretch period for distributions. So there are pluses and minuses. You right. really need to be careful. Okay, that's great. And there's there's one other question. It's a little complicated. If a child lives in the house with the parent and the parent ends up in skilled nursing and on Medicaid, does the child need to move and sell the house at some time? And is the question, is the answer different if the child has special needs? Well, Rich, that's right. That, that's like you know, a final exam question for you. <laughs> Actually, that's one I can answer without, it depends. If the child has been living in the house with the parent for two or more years, immediately before the parent went into a nursing home and the child was providing care that allowed the parent to stay in the house for that two or more year period, then the house can be transferred to the caregiving child even when, well, when the parent goes into the nursing home. That is the child caregiver exception to the five-year look-back rule. Uh -huh. So the child does not have to be evicted. And if it is a special needs child, the house can be transferred to a special needs child outright or into a trust, even if that child has not been living for two or more years in the house before the person went into a nursing home. So for most people, most children, there, are, there is a way of transferring the house to the caregiving child. The only time you wouldn't be able to do that is if the child had been living in that house and did not have special needs and was not there for at least two years. Okay, is that the last question, Beth? Um, okay, there's one more, so it's kind of a, a an, an extra question along that last one. What if the child was not a caregiver and the dad went uh, from an operation right into skilled nursing? I can't answer that question the way I would like to because we're being recorded. So, um, so it depends. Yes, I, it, depends. it depends. <clears throat> it depends. Okay. Uh, whoever asked that question, if you want to reach out to me, uh, we can talk about that. All right. Any <laughs> any others, Beth? Nope, that's it. All right. Well, thank you, Dave and Rich, for the informative, complex, and if I'm being honest, scary presentation. <laughs> <laughs> this is an area where I believe so many people make mistakes. I think mostly because most people just don't know what they don't know, and there is a lot to know in this area. And by failing to consult a professional early on, we can make some very costly errors. Um, so um, before we close, um, I'd like to highlight our upcoming presentations. The next webinar is April 13th. Uh, it's on um, end of life planning with Diane McGee and Joan A. Silk. And the, uh, the May presentation is on trust planning. And that's May 18th. Uh, we do have a very short three question survey that we would very much appreciate you completing. This survey, survey will help us plan for future topics and keep us on track for creating content that you want and you need. Finally, we're happy to answer any questions that you, that you have, and we do invite you to check out our website. Um, and if you have any questions about this evening's presentations, uh, presentation, please feel free to reach out directly to our speakers. Uh, until next time, we look forward to hearing from you and hope you, your family, and your loved ones will join us each month. And thank you. Thank you, Dora. Thank, thank you, you. everyone. Thank Be you. well. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>